Amen. If I could get someone to close those doors back there, if someone doesn't mind, the reason being is because the cool air just vents out those doors. <laughs> and there's uh, no way of stopping it except by those doors. Try to hold in the cold air as much as possible since it's uh, record-breaking temperatures outside. I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. Matthew chapter 17, we're looking at one of the most unusual signs in the life of Christ, miraculous uh, events in the life of Christ that you will find in the gospel accounts, in which he is uh, transfigured before three of his apostles. He takes aside chapter 17 and verse 1, Peter, James, and John. Some authors refer to them as the inner circle. Some have referred to them as the best friends that Jesus had. He would pull aside Peter, James, and John and show them things or tell them things that he would not tell the rest, spend time with them. And it says that they went up on a high mountain, chapter 17 and verse 1 of Matthew. We're not told what mountain that is um, in the account. Some have speculated uh, various uh, mountains that it could have been. Uh, it's not important, ultimately. Uh, verse 2, he was transfigured before them. Now, in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 9, it says, while he was praying, he was transfigured before them. So, Jesus was praying, and he was transfigured before them. That is the word for metamorphosis in Greek. A change took place, a visible change in his appearance took place. And his face, verse 2, shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Um, Luke 9 and verse 29 in that account says that his robe became white and glistening. Glistening refers to a brilliance like you would see in lightning. That's what the word is referring to. So that was spectacular enough as we're going over a review of the Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17. That in itself is pretty awesome, pretty spectacular for Christ to be going through this uh, Transfiguration. But that's not the end of it. Verse 3, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. So here you have the appearance of two great men, two great saints of the Old Testament. Moses and Elijah. And in, in looking back on what we studied in, in the, the previous lessons, what did Moses and Elijah represent as they were talking to Christ? The law and the prophets. Moses, the great lawgiver. Elijah, one of the great prophets, even though he... He himself did not write anything. He was one of the great prophets, highly respected. In fact, uh, the Old Testament predicted that the forerunner to the Messiah would be Elijah. Not literally Elijah, but come in the spirit and likeness of Elijah. And we know that's John the Baptist. He was very much like Elijah. And so you have Moses, and then you have Elijah appearing, talking with him. Luke tells us, or excuse me, Mark tells us in Mark 9 and verse 31 that they spoke to Jesus about his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Mark 9 and verse 31. They, they were talking to Jesus, Moses and Elijah, about his decease he was about to go through in Jerusalem. What's that talking about? What was his decease? His fiction, exactly. His death. They were talking to him about his death that he was going to accomplish uh, in Jerusalem. So, again, here's another spectacular event on top of that spectacular event. Moses and Elijah uh, appearing, talking to him. Verse 4 of Matthew uh, 17 
Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And the other accounts say, because he did not know what to say, not knowing what he said. And verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud. Here's a third spectacular event on top of this. The bright cloud, verse 5, overshadowed them. And then something on top of that. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased, hear him. So you have one event after the other. Beginning with Jesus being transfigured, the glory of God, as it were, shining through his physical nature that he had in the flesh, and then Moses and Elijah appearing, talking to him about the death he was going to die in Jerusalem, Peter speaking up, saying, let's make three tabernacles. A bright cloud overshadowed them. What's the significance of this bright cloud? Why would this cause, as um, verse 6 says, the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid? What the bright cloud represent in the Old Testament? God. We have some examples of that. The tabernacle, exactly. Moses and the tabernacle. Exodus uh, 13 talks about the, the cloud. Exodus 19, Exodus 24, Exodus 40 talks about that cloud, that pillar of cloud by day. And that pillar of fire by night that led the children of Israel. And then when Moses constructed the tabernacle, that cloud came upon the tabernacle and showed God's presence and approval of the tabernacle after Moses had completed it exactly as God instructed according to the pattern. God has always given a pattern for that which he has, whether it be a physical building or an organization. The church has a pattern to follow. And so we see here that this bright cloud represents the presence of God. Also in 2 Chronicles 5, verses 13 and 14, 2 Chronicles 7 also, we see the cloud coming upon the temple that Solomon built. Again, Solomon building it according to the pattern. God's presence in the form of that cloud came upon the temple showing God's approval of what had happened. If that was not spectacular enough, that bright cloud, and the, the reason why Peter, James, and John were afraid is because they knew the Old Testament. They knew this bright cl cl cloud represented the presence of God. Plus the voice. The voice coming from it. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. The disciples were uh, heard it. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, verse 7, and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. As we look at uh, what uh, Brother Winkler says in, on page 79 of the book, we look at number 3 there, the cloud and the voice. It says, We observe that this cloud, this brightness of this cloud, cloud and the fear which it produced suggests that it was the Shekinah glory, the cloud of glory, which was a symbol of God's peculiar presence, J.W. McGarvey tells us in the Fourfold Gospel, page 420. For a study of the Shekinah as a re representation of God's presence, observe several texts of the Old Testament, and we already named these texts, and you can look them up, that shows that this, this is God's physical manifestation of himself in a way that could be detected with the senses. Uh, under normal circumstances, we cannot see, hear, feel, taste, nor touch God with our five senses. We know God based upon the evidence around us and based upon the scripture. We know that he uh, exists based upon that evidence. And so we see here that God, in, when he was revealing things in the Old Testament and in the New, 
uh, he would make himself known sometimes in this fashion. It says also, second, let us study the voice that spoke from it. The voice was a voice of affirmation, commendation, and exaltation. Affirming, this is my beloved son. Who is he talking about? Jesus. Not Moses. Not Elijah. Jesus. Moses was a great man, but he was uh, just a man. Elijah was a great man. God took him up into heaven. He didn't see death. But he was just a man. This is my beloved son. Also, commendation in whom I am well pleased. That means Jesus did nothing but please God. Jesus never sinned. I've recently got into a discussion with someone who is trying to make this person claims to believe the Bible, but they're trying to make the argument that Jesus broke the Sabbath. And I'm trying to get across to them that if Jesus broke the Sabbath, he would have sinned. That would have been a violation of God's will. And what Jesus broke was the traditions of the Pharisees that they placed upon the Sabbath. Man-made traditions. He broke that. That wasn't from God. But the Sabbath laws and everything surrounding the Sabbath, Jesus kept perfectly. He never violated it. And Jesus never sinned. That's why Hebrews chapter 14 tells us that he was tempted in every way that we were tempted, yet without sin. He never violated the will of God, whether it be ceremonially or morally or in thought, word, deed. He never sinned. So on whom I'm well pleased is, is in the ultimate sense. He did everything that pleased the Father. And it was a voice of exaltation Hear him. Hear him. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. In John 17 and verse 2, as Jesus prayed to the Father, he said, You have given me authority over all flesh. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth over all humanity. So the voice was a voice of affirmation, commendation, and exaltation, affirming that Jesus was divine, the Son of God, that he was perfect, he always pleased the Father, and that he is to be the one listened to in the sense of you've got to hear him. If you want to be pleasing to me, God is saying, you've got to hear my Son. You've got to listen to him. So we see here the significance of this transfiguration as it impressed upon Peter, James, and John and upon us as we're reading the account of it here in the gospel account of who Jesus was, uh, the kind of life that he lived, and how we are to listen to him. Peter, quoting Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 5 through 19, said in the sermon on Solomon's porch, And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Acts 3, 22 through 23. Talking about the prophet that was to arise. It's like Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18 speaks of. And so we are to listen to Jesus. Truly Christ is God's prophet. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4. Let's go ahead and, and read that. He is the last and final prophet of God. And even those who wrote the New Testament, Paul, Peter, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jude, James, I already, hadn't already said James, they spoke as they were guided by the Holy Spirit, the Lord's will. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, Know that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So all of the New Testament, when it's God's will being revealed, is the words of the Lord, not just the red letters, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, 
has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He being the brightness of his glory, that was shown forth in the transfiguration, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, that's the death on the cross, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's his ascension back to the Father. So we see here that we are to, to listen to Christ and do his will. Uh, as Brother Winkler says on page 79, the New Testament is the teaching of Christ, 2nd 9 through 11. We must abide in the doctrine of Christ to have both the Father and the Son. And also bringing in other scriptures to be in the spirit, we have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. So to have God and have a proper relationship with God, we have to abide within the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, to hear him, we must hear the testament, his testament, his covenant. And there are the scriptures that go along with that. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Hebrews 12 and verse 25. We are not to hear the voice of the church, the voice of the papacy, the voice of a modern-day prophet, nor the voice of a cultic leader. We're to listen to Jesus. Yes, Carrie, do you have a discretion? Okay. Does anyone have anything, a comment or, or question? This is, this is a lesson for us to take to heart when it comes to any matter what does the Bible say in fact that TV program that Johnny Robertson is on that's the title of his program what does the Bible say and his point is that's what we've got to ask because that's God's word we're not to listen to what people get together and vote on we're not to listen to uh, some, some hierarchy in a denomination or some man we are to listen to to Christ as revealed in the New Testament. Now let's look at the events after the transfiguration and then we're going to go into uh, some practical areas about the transfiguration and how it, it'll help us as Christians. The subsequent events, page 79. When the disciples heard the voice, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. At other times, we find similar reactions with the Israelites, Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 through 22. They wanted Moses to speak to them, not God. They were afraid to hear God. Daniel in Daniel 8 and verse 17. And John on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 1 and verse 17. However, Jesus came and touched the disciples and said, Arise, do not be afraid. His touch assured them that he was still in his fleshly body. I think that's a very good point that I've never thought about. The fact that he touched them to let them know, I'm still here in the flesh. Because they could have thought, from what they've seen in the transfiguration, he's not going to be a part of flesh and blood anymore as far as that's concerned. You know, he, they might have thought this, this was his uh, uh, glorious departure, so to speak, from this world. Uh, they didn't know. See, we have the benefit of having the rest of the story in the New Testament. But put yourself in Peter, James, and John's sandals, as it were. Not shoes, but sandals. And they're seeing this for the first time. They, you know, Peter speaks up. He doesn't know what to say. And they're, they don't know that what's happening here. And it was an amazing thing. And remember, they were, they were awoken out of a, um, a deep sleep, which some have suggested this could have taken place taken place at night of course we don't know because the bible doesn't say for sure so they wake up and they see this transfiguration they see moses and elijah talking to him and and, and then the bright cloud then the voice this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased hear him and they're greatly afraid they're on the ground afraid and after all of that goes back to normal jesus is there alone he touches them and lets them know rise do not be afraid it's very interesting, um, when God manifests his glory, like in uh, Exodus 20, uh, Daniel 
8 and verse 17, when Christ is pictured in glory there in Revelation chapter 1, the reaction of people. You see this in Isaiah chapter 6 as well, with Isaiah being called to be a prophet. How he says, woe is unto me, I am undone. There, there is a sense of unworthiness and a sense of awe and respect and reverence toward God. And I believe we need to get back to that among God's people. So many brethren have become nonchalant when it comes towards worshiping God. Even in worshiping in spirit and in truth, we, we forget the reverence sometimes. And you know, even I could do this, we all can. We, our mind starts wondering about you know things that we are concerned about. We get back to a reverent attitude and how that we, as the Bible talks about those in Nehemiah's day and in Ezra's day who trembled at the words of God's book. Trembled. Reverence towards God. Something that we desperately, desperately need. And I think that's exactly why we have, and I've said this before, the description of Jesus in glory in the book of Revelation, but we don't have a physical description of what Jesus looked like when he walked the earth. Nowhere. But we have a word picture of what he looked like in glory in Revelation chapter 1. From his head to his feet. I think that's to instill within us a sense of reverence towards Christ. The one that we are to, uh, to hear. Then in verse 9, Matthew 17 and verse 9, As they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And on page 80, uh, Brother Winkler says, We may not know exactly why this restriction was given. However, to have related the vision could possibly have created envy among the disciples, other disciples. Two, at this juncture, they did not fully understand the imminent abrogation of the law. So he gives a couple of suggestions as to why Jesus at that time says, don't tell what you saw until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. What are some other possible reasons why Jesus told him, don't tell what you saw on the mountain at this time? right hard to describe what you you just saw yes that's a very good point the 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 pharisees and the sadducees would would be uh even more inclined to uh, want to get rid of him uh if they heard about this happening especially the sadducees because they don't believe in an afterlife so moses appearing is kind of proof positive that their theology is wrong. Um, that's a good point. One other person suggested just uh, when the man who was cleansed of leprosy was told, don't tell anyone, go to the priest. What did that man with leprosy do? He reported it to everyone around there, and what did that cause Jesus to have to do? He had to go because he couldn't move around. He couldn't be mobile in that area anymore because of the, the disobedience of that man that was cleansed of leprosy. He should have not spread that, but do exactly what Jesus said, go to the priest and offer the sacrifice. But when he did, the multitude of crowds came around and he couldn't be mobile anymore. So there could be various reasons um, as to why he tells them, don't tell anyone about this vision. Another possible reason is this. What were the apostles promised after Jesus was resurrected and he ascended back to heaven that would help them teach? The Holy Spirit, do you say? The Holy Spirit. So if they tried to explain it, 
you know, in their own way, in their own human terms, they, they would get it messed up, most likely. But if they had the Holy Spirit guiding them and, and instructing them in the words to describe it, then you would have an accurate representation of what actually uh, took place. Right. Exactly, wouldn't be any contradiction at all. And, and in fact, um, that's what Jesus said to the apostles, that he will bring back to your memory the things that I've taught you. So they, the apostles would not be uh, having conflicting reports. So there were many things that they, they needed to be guided in even after Jesus left. And uh, that's basically it. Now looking at building a better me from the text, there on page 80... Let's look at a few things. A time and a place is needed for the apart life, yea, to be intimate with God. He talks about going aside as Jesus did on the mountain, going apart on the mountain. And he uh, talks about uh, we need that time to, to have devotions, family devotionals, personal devotions in which we pray. He says there is a need for the apart life for families. Families must find time to draw nigh to one another and to God. And I like this statement. Families that come apart do not come apart. That's a very good statement. They come apart to spend time and devotion to God. They don't come apart as far as splitting up and, and things of that nature uh, the spiritual uh, holds them together through the diff very difficult times. And so that, that, that time that you see in, in the life of Jesus, oftentimes when he would even go apart by himself with no one, go apart and uh, pray, and the disciples would go looking for him. Uh, so we see an example of that, that time that we need to spend time in prayer and and our devotion to God, as we talked about Sunday, casting all our cares upon God because He cares for us. And uh, I would encourage fathers, and I try to do this on a regular basis, don't always get to because sometimes in life we get so busy and got so many things going on, to take time to, to pray with your children at night, to take the time to study with them, teach them, ask them questions, you know, about the Bible, about especially what they learn in Bible class and things of that nature, instill the importance of spiritual things uh, in your children. Number two, prayer will change us. Of course, he's not talking about in the same way it changed Jesus in the Transfiguration, but in the fact that it makes us better people. We often hear prayer changes things. Hannah prayed, and she became a mother. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hezekiah prayed and his life was lengthened 15 years. 2 Kings 20. Elijah prayed and rain was restrained and then rain was given. James chapter 5 verse 17 through 19. But prayer changes us. And B. Hardeman said the best place to pray for potatoes is at the end of a hole handle. The point is Prayer is valueless unless coupled with action. Accordingly, what about praying for the sick and the lost and then doing nothing? We pray for the sick, but we don't make any effort to go see how we can help them. We should be praying for them and then saying, how can I help you? What can I do? Can I go to the store for you? And seeing what we could do to help them out. Again, praying for the lost and people being converted but not being busy ourselves and spreading the gospel, involved in evangelism. So uh, we, we have to have prayer and then the action that follows uh, prayer. Uh, number three, we should have a great interest in Calvary. As... Um, Moses and Elijah were talking to Jesus about his decease, and that Greek word is the word for exodus. 
he was about to make an exodus out of Jerusalem when he died. When he died on the cross, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. His spirit exited out of his body. As previously observed, Moses and Elijah were interested in Calvary because of the retroactive cleansing of Jesus' blood. Hebrews 9.15, Romans 3.25, Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4 speak of how Jesus' blood was retroactive and cleansed the faithful saints of the Old Testament. I mean, Moses and Elijah were in paradise because of what Jesus was going to do at Jerusalem for their sins. And not only for their sins, but for Adam's sins, for Noah's sins, for Abraham's sins. You just name all of the Old Testament faithful. So they were interested in what Jesus was going to do and dying on the cross for them. We should also have an interest in Calvary. Why? Had there been no decease at Jerusalem, there had been no death at Jerusalem, there would have been no abrogation of the law of Moses. Colossians 2, 14 through 17, and Ephesians 2, 13 through 17. We would, well, those who were Jewish would still be under the law of Moses and the animal sacrifices. Without Jesus dying at Jerusalem, there would not be a church because he purchased it with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. And he's the savior of the body. He cleanses it. Ephesians 5 and verse 25. There would not be the church of Christ without Christ dying at Jerusalem. That brought it into existence because the church is the saved. The Lord adds the saved to the church. Acts 2 and verse 47. Without Jesus dying in Jerusalem, there would be no remission of sin. Forgiveness. Matthew 26 and verse 28. We could not have forgiveness at all. There would be no redemption being purchased back. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. There would be no reconciliation being brought back into relationship with God. Ephesians 2 and verse 13. 13. There would be no justification. Romans 5 and verse 9. We could not be pronounced not guilty by the blood of Jesus Christ if that blood had not been shed in Jerusalem. There would be no sanctification, that is, being set apart for God's purposes, being holy. Hebrews 13 and verse 12. There would be no cleansing of our sins. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. And of course, there would be no washing of our sins. Revelation 1 verses 5 through 6. So, everything we owe to Christ and what he did at Jerusalem. We would not be the church. We would not be Christians. We would not have the forgiveness of sins. We would not have all the spiritual blessings that are in Christ if it were not what he did for what he did at Jerusalem. And what did God design into the worship of the church to remind us on a regular basis? The Lord's Supper. On the first day of the week. Acts 20 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians 11, to remind us of that sacrifice that was made. He put it in there on a weekly basis because he knows we would forget. We would forget. And we need to be reminded of that memorial every first day of the week. Number four, we see our great need for divine revelation. Uh, Mark 9 verses 5 through 6 Peter did not know what to say he apparently thought that the spiritual beings could be housed in temples physical dwellings N nature may reveal a supreme being Romans 1 verse 20 and 21 but without divine revelation we will never know God's expectation for us and what he's saying there is we can look around and we can see and know by the creation that there is a supreme being there is a God but we're not going to know what he has for us as far as what we're supposed to do, his commands, his will for our life, without the written revelation. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. And that's what you find in places where God's will isn't there, you have all kind of wickedness and idolatry and paganism. There's no restraint. 
but happy is he who keeps the law, Proverbs 29 and verse 18. The way of man is not in himself, Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. It's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. We've got to be told what to do, what to avoid, what God wants. And that's what the scriptures are about. It is whereby, not without divine revelation, that we understand the scheme of redemption. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 7, that text of Scripture says God revealed it through the apostles and prophets and wrote it down. And Paul said, when you read, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. That in other ages had not been revealed to the sons of men, but have now been revealed through these apostles and prophets. So what is written down is for us to read and understand. Therefore, how thankful to God we should be for the Bible. And that is true. Psalm 109 and verse 105. It's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We would be in total darkness, spiritually speaking, without God's Word. Very quickly, the last two points. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to go into the, the next chapter, which will be chapter 10 on page 85. So be studying that for next week, chapter 10 on page 85. We must hear Christ. Hear Him. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. That means we listen, we believe, we obey. We obey His will. We must hear Christ, for example, when He gives the plan of salvation, when He tells us uh, to properly arrange our priorities, when He tells us to watch our attitudes, when He tells us how to solve personal differences, when He gives us His law concerning marriage, divorce, and remarriage, when He instructs us on how to properly worship, and when He gives us our mission, we've got to listen to Jesus. What is His will? We've got to look into His Word and let His Word tell us His will concerning these things. And then finally, number six, we get an insight into what death really is. It is a decease, an exodus, a departure from this life. And by the way, we probably touched on this two weeks ago. I can't remember. That was two weeks ago, and it's been very hot outside. I can't think properly when it's 110. So if we talked about this, forgive me. Did you notice that Peter, James, and John knew who Moses was and who Elijah was? Did they have name tags? How would they know who Mo Moses had been dead for 1,500 years? Elijah had been taken up into heaven 900 years before they were born. There's recognition of identity in the spirit realm. I believe that's what that's telling us. Somehow, some way, they knew this is Moses, this is Elijah. How? I don't know. That's one of those Deuteronomy 29, 29 passages or issues. The secret things belong to the Lord. But they knew that this was Moses and Elijah somehow. So Moses and Elijah still retain their identity in death, even though Elijah didn't die. And they were still who they were in the spirit realm. And Jesus, when he died, it was a departure. Remember what Paul said in uh, 2 Timothy, the time of my departure is at hand. And Peter talked about his departure, his leaving. And that's what it is. It's the spirit leaving the body. James 2 and verse 26. Faith without works is dead as the body without the spirit is dead. And so it's the spirit leaving the body. The word deceased means exodus or departure. Therefore, death is a picture of as a journey, this analogy is quite revealing. Do we not prepare for our journeys? When you go on vacation, do you prepare for it? You get ready for it, you get all your clothes, you make sure everything's in order, put a hold on the mail, or do whatever you have to do, make sure, sure someone's going to feed the animals. You prepare for a departure. You prepare for a journey. Do we not prepare in proportion to the time we will spend when we reach our destiny? If we're going to be there for two weeks, we prepare for two weeks. 
we're going to be there for a month, we prepare for a month. If we're going to be there for eternity, do we prepare? Do we not desire companionship on our journeys? You want someone to be with you. Again, we want someone to go with us into eternity, share the gospel with them, we teach them the gospel, get them converted to Christ, added to the church. These observations can properly be applied to the journey of death. Amos 4 and verse 12 says, prepare to meet your God. In the context there was dealing with impending doom, but the application is we need to prepare. And we prepare in this life. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, Psalm 23 and verse 4, we will fear no evil. Yes. One nineteen verse. Oh, yeah, okay. One nineteen verse one hundred five. Okay. Up there at the very top. Thank you for that. So one nineteen verse one hundred five of Psalms. There. And so the point is, it's it's a journey, and 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 this has been emphasized so many times. All of us here will be somewhere in a hundred years. And all of us will be somewhere in eternity. And we need to get ready for that. And we need to prepare ourselves for that. Now for our devotional time, we'll look at Second Peter and see that Peter, even towards the end of his life, Second Peter chapter 1, he never forgot what happened on that mountain. And by inspiration, he's going to write about it. In our devotional time, we're going to talk about what Peter says about the transfiguration of Christ uh, many, many years later when he writes about it in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. Remember, we're going to study the next chapter, I think it's chapter 10, for next week, Lord willing.